Thank you, President Mull, esteemed faculty, administration, board of trustees, parents, family, and friends, and mostly to the 2022 graduating class of Berkeley College of Music. I am so proud and so honored to be here today to share this day with you, which is hugely important in your life. I want to thank all the performers of last night's incredible concert. I have to say that while I was listening to it, I realized that I would not have gotten into this college. <laughs> really, it was, it was just so impressive and mind-blowing and virtuosic and soulful, and the, the joy and the energy that came out of all of you was spectacular. Bravo, thank you. Uh, I'd love to congratulate also Chuck Rainey, Layla Hathaway on your well-deserved honors. <laughs> on behalf of all the graduates, I want to thank your parents and families who have facilitated all of this. Perhaps somewhere along the line, your parents were initially slightly hesitant about sending you off to a music school. I don't know, maybe. I after all, it ain't consulting or wealth management. <laughs> At some moment, your children had an impulse that they couldn't quite articulate that seemed to have something to do with music. And that impulse coalesced into an idea. And as that idea became clear to them, it became a dream. And you helped them to realize that. Bravo. Now, we all love praise and adulation, and I certainly am no exception to that rule. However, the praise and adulation that I have received since yesterday and this morning has been slightly embarrassing. Because I'll give you a quick overview of who I really am. Uh, I vacillate between feeling like a profound and elegant composer on some days, and on others, filled with self-doubt, anxiousness, anxiety, concern. I would like to say that I understand exactly what it took for you all to get through the last four years, but I can't really, because I dropped out of, my, of USC, actually, with a full piano performance scholarship before the end of my first semester. Um, and then I got a succession of jobs, which were not so particularly promising. I, I got a job making candles, <laughs> stuffing cushions, lubricating injection molding machines. And if you don't know what that is, that's a giant machine that makes plastic things. And in my case, it was making Frisbees. <laughs> uh, I eventually tried my hand as a drill press operator and was fired pretty quickly with a pink slip that said, incapable of comprehending this kind of work. <laughs> um, they were so right. Uh, so I moved up to Berkeley, California, where I was going to hang out with some friends of mine, go Berkeley, and um, they were up there attending the university, and I got a job selling vacuum cleaners door to door. Now, what a different world it was. People would actually open their doors to me, and I would walk in and dump a huge canister of sand on their living room floor, <laughs> and then vacuum it up. The, the problem was that these vacuum cleaners were very expensive. Uh, I sold two. Uh, <laughs> And they were both to the same wealthy friend of mine who lived in the <laughs> neighborhood. So I, uh, from there, I went up and moved into a really leaky shack with a friend of mine in Rogue River, Oregon, um, where I lived on food stamps and sold woven belts on the street corner. So 1971 comes along, and I, I can't say it was a moment of clarity, but I had a sudden and powerful sense that it was pretty easy to see, I was wasting my life. It was some kind of an opening, some kind of a beginning, 
kind of a cosmic wake-up call. So I hitchhiked back to LA, enrolled in a junior college, and while I was there for my first and only semester, I got a call from a friend of mine who said there was a band, they were looking for a keyboard player, they were making an album, did I want to audition? I did, I got the job. And within a week, I was in a recording studio for the first time in my life. The band was going nowhere. However, it was during that time I started writing instrumental music for whatever reason. And after two years of, I'd been with Elton, that's a whole other story. I mean, the Elton thing is, I could tell you a half hour story about that, but I'll give you the quick version. I got a call, did I want to audition for Elton? Sure, are you kidding? What do you think I said? Um, I drove back to LA and was instructed to go to the Hamburger Hamlet at Sunset Boulevard in Doheny and look for a purple Rolls Royce. Uh, which I did, and I followed the Rolls Royce uh, way up into the hills, way up to the hills, and we pulled up in front of a very huge mansion and I was led in to the living room and about three minutes later in walked 28-year-old Elton John wearing tennis clothes. Um, I, I could barely talk um, and he was not that much better. We were both incredibly shy. Uh, there was a piano in the room and I was sitting there hoping against all odds I wouldn't have to sit down and start playing the piano for Elton John. Anyway, he played me a couple of rough tracks from his new album and uh, said rehearsals would begin in two weeks in Amsterdam, and a week after that, we played Wembley Stadium in London for 80,000 people. It was a... I think that's why I tend to call, sort of bracket my life under the heading of uh, the world is filled with limitless possibilities. So having, uh, I was writing all this instrumental music, I ended up making a little solo album, blah, 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 blah. And after working with Elton, I had some credibility in Los Angeles and I came back to Los Angeles and I was starting to get offered orchestration jobs with people like Barbra Streisand and Toto and Earth, Wind & Fire and that was really fun. And I also started co-writing some songs and producing records. And oftentimes, the musicians during those sessions would say, James, why aren't you writing music for TV? Or why aren't you writing music for movies? And I said, well, there's a very good reason for that, because I haven't got a clue how you would do that. Um, and what President Mull said was absolutely right. Uh, I had a great deal of fear about that kind of thing. But in 1984, I was offered a movie, which I immediately turned down. But I was later convinced to take it. And from then on, that's kind of all I did. When I did take the movie, I have to say that there were a few rough spots, but I knew then and there that I had found my life's calling. I would say that in the first 10 years of my career, I was extremely arrogant. I was sure that I knew more about the music and more about the movie that I was working on than anybody else, including the director. I would respond badly at the prospect of having to rewrite anything. It's a miracle I wasn't fired. Eventually, I began to understand that the most important thing I could do as a film composer was to tell the same story that the director was trying to tell. And the better listener I became, the better composer I became. Without a doubt, over my entire film career, I have come, I have come to accept rejection every bit as often as success. I'll give you a picture of how that happens sometimes in my world. In my studio, there is a couch behind where I sit at my rig, where I play back my demos for directors and producers and editors uh, of the scores that I'm working on for them. Now you have to understand, I'm very good at making demos. I'm kind of famous for it. So my demos sound, kind of, they can sound like the London Symphony, uh, and yet, I can't begin to tell you the number of times I have played back a huge cue, five, six, seven, ten minutes long, all hell breaking loose, huge action, 
tender love scene squeezed into the middle of it. They're all sitting on the couch. I hit play. I am buzzing with excitement. Their movie is about to come to life. I'm expecting them to swoon, to be thrilled. And when it's over, there is silence. After a few extremely tense moments, I turn around to face them. Everybody looks very concerned. The director says, can I hear it again? Or I don't get it? Or can I hear the temp? And in one unforgettable playback, the film editor remarked, there are so many things wrong with that, I don't know where to start. I wanted to physically assault him. <laughs> I wish I could tell you that my success is the result of hard work, self-discipline, and sacrifice, and to a large extent, it is. But it is also the result of luck. I don't believe we make our own luck, but I do believe we need to be available, willing, and capable of responding when the opportunity knocks. Today is the culmination of your commitment to the possibility of a life in music, and you have expressed a willingness to expose your vulnerable innermost selves to possible rejection, definite rejection, and criticism. You're about to be jettisoned out of the protective embrace of this college into a culture that is often dumbed down to a lower denominator and encourages us to take shortcuts. I see it in my business all the time. Don't settle for mediocre. You will become what you practice most, so practice excellence. Practice creativity. Remember, the creative muscle is a muscle like anything else. It needs to be exercised and strengthened. Accept self-doubt as a frequent visitor, but not a dominant force in your life. Be uncompromising about finding your life's work, but be open. Be open to it being something that you can't imagine for yourself right now. The world will try and chip away at your values in those moments. Recall feelings today, the way you feel today, long enough to consider the right thing. You will not help but succeed. I wish you much happiness in your new life that you are about to begin. Thank you and congratulations.